I'm Spencer Bailey. This is Time Sensitive. everyone, welcome back to Time Sensitive. I'm particularly excited to start season eight with this conversation with the legendary theater director, playwright, performer, choreographer, video artist, painter, sculptor, and sound and lighting designer, Robert Wilson, someone who has done a lot of thinking about time. This episode, fittingly, has been a long time in the making, nearly three years, I think, and it's the first time we've ever recorded an episode outside of the studio. Our sound engineer, Johnny, and I took a day trip to the Watermill Center in Watermill, New York, on Long Island, an arts and humanities institution founded by Robert in 1992. Perhaps best known as the director of the four-act opera Einstein on the Beach, which was composed with Philip Glass and made its debut in 1976, Robert has nearly 200 stage productions to his name. These include Dorian, which had its debut at the Schauspiel House Theater in Dusseldorf last year, and will have performances there, as well as at the National Connus Drama Theater in Lithuania this fall. And The Life and Death of Marina Abramovich, which premiered at the Manchester International Festival in 2011. Other directorial productions of Robert's showing this year include Shakespeare's The Tempest at the National Theater of Sofia, Bulgaria, Giacomo Puccini's Turn a Doe at the Opera Bastille in Paris, Edward Alvey's play Three Tall Women at the Municipal Theater of Piraeus in Athens, and Relative Calm, a collaboration with the dancer Lucinda Childs at the Grand Hall de la Villette in Paris. What stands out about Robert's work, among many things, is his rare ability to disorient his viewers while also enchanting them. His performances can be puzzling, and that's exactly the point. As we discuss on this episode, he wants to give people space to think. Time is central to his work, as is light. And in his hands, time can expand and contract. Depending on the production, he can both leave people on their toes or cajole them into a sleep-like trance. Many critics, writers, and scholars have all agreed that Robert has completely reshaped and widened the landscape of theater, vastly expanding its vocabularies and horizons. As you may notice, when in conversation, he sometimes leaves long pauses. This is intentional, not just performance. As with his theater productions, Robert makes space to let ideas flow in and for new potentials to arise. It was incredibly special to share this time with him in Watermill. Before we get into the episode, I'd first like to thank our Season 8 presenting sponsor, the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels, which this year is working with the American Museum of Natural History in New York to present the exhibition Garden of Green, Exquisite Jewelry by Van Cleef and Arpels at the museum's Mignone Hall of Gems and Minerals. On view through January 2024, Garden of Green showcases 44 creations from the French High Jewelry House, 32 of which are on view in the U.S. for the first time. Creating a lush garden of jewelry, this impressive array of precious and ornamental green stones forms a dazzling journey that celebrates the beauty of gardens and nature. One area of the exhibition space highlights the diversity of green stones. Another concentrates on particular materials such as jade, chrysoprase, and malachite, and a third displays a selection of majestic creations set with emeralds. You can learn more at www.amnh.org slash exhibitions. That's www.amnh.org slash exhibitions. And now, here's my conversation with Bob. Hi, Bob. Welcome to Time Sensitive. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's begin on the subject of silence. Mm -hmm. You've said that the best way to hear anything is to listen to silence. And many writers and critics and thinkers have observed that the earliest silent operas you did, The King of Spain, The Life and Times of Sigmund Freud, Deaf Man Glance, were effectively a form of giving structure to silence. How would you describe your relationship with and approach to silence? I was uh, very interested uh, in the the beginning of the 60s um, 
in what John Cage said, there's no such thing as silence, that there's always sound. And sometimes when we're very quiet, we, we hear more carefully than we do when we're making sound. But there's always sound. As long as you're alive, there's sound. You're breathing or there's the heart beating. So it's a starting point. And in the 60s, uh, I adopted a deaf mute boy. And as far as we could measure his hearing in decibels, up to 110 decibels, he heard nothing. And one evening, he was standing at the end of the loft that I had at 147 Spring Street. Uh, with his back to me. So we were about 75 feet apart. And I cried out to him uh, in a high-pitched voice, Raymond! And it's a loud scream. And um, he didn't hear me. I knew if I would stamp my foot on the floor, he'd feel the vibration and turn around. But I did a very curious thing. I went, Hey, man, in the sound of a deaf person. And he turned around. And he started to walk to me. Hey, man, how are you? Raymond, how are you in the sound of a deaf person? And he started laughing like, hey, man, you're talking my language. <laughs> so it's very strange that, you know, in a sense, he was hearing, but the body feels and hears. And uh, so he was feeling the vibrations of sound that he was more familiar with than the hearing Wolf's language. So those were very important uh, moments in my late 20s when uh, these that happened with Raymond the reading of Cage and his book, Silence, and uh, then meeting Cage. I remember when we first met, it was a dinner in New York and maybe 120 people in the room. And before the dinner, you gave some remarks. And before those remarks, you left about maybe three, four minutes of silence it was so powerful because the whole room kind of shifted from this <laughs> cacophony, people drinking wine, getting ready for a dinner, right, to feeling a different kind of vibration. And I wanted to ask, what do you think sort of happens in that moment when you make space or time for that silence? Well, if... There's a very loud sound. And after that, the space of sound is very different. I could speak loudly, but if I wait for the... And now I speak, I can speak quieter, and people listen more carefully. So... And the more space around anything, the bigger it becomes. Oh. In the early 90s, maybe it's 1990, I directed uh, Madame Butterfly, Puccini's Butterfly, at the Paris Opera. And for the death of Butterfly, at the end, she stood on stage in a rather severe black dress, and she held her right hand and arm up parallel to the floor. Her death was she moved only one finger, the index finger, down. That one moment, that tiny little moment at the Paris Opera, that tiny movement, had such power. And usually in, in opera, the singers are so exaggerated and so big with a gesture movement, but it was very carefully lit. 
But it's amazing how this one tiny gesture and that big house became bigger than the big gesture that we normally see of opera singers because there was more space around it. And if, if we're talking about silence, we're also talking about listening. And you famously advised actors and performers to listen to every moment, everything that's happening, every movement. Your work in many ways is about providing space and time to listen, or at least that's how I see it. And I was wondering if that's how you see it. Do you, do you think about it as it, it's almost like providing the space to listen? Well, I came from Texas. I had not seen theater. I had been to an opera. There's no chance to see opera in the community where I grew up in Texas. And I didn't really like it so much. I saw the work of George Balanchine at the New York City Ballet, and I like that very much, and I still do. And I think the reason I liked it is that it, watching Balanchine's ballets and how he had the performer approach a mental state of mind to perform, uh, there was so much space that it gave me time to think. And I realized that, you know, if you went on Broadway, everything is speeded up. So you really don't have too much time to think. And the same with opera. So Atel Adnan, uh, the author and philosopher and painter, uh, came to see my first play in Paris in 1971. It was the Deaf Man Glance, Le Regard de Sur. And she saw it three times, and she came back and introduced herself and said that she liked my work. And I said, uh, ask her why. And she said, it gives me time to think and the space to dream I think that was one of the reasons I made the theater I made. I don't know. It happened by accident. I made this play that was seven hours long, and it was supposed to be performed twice in the Festival of Nancy, and Jack Lang had invited me. Uh, at the time, he was head of the festival, later became the Minister of Culture. And Pierre Cardin saw this seven-hour play in silence, said, I'd like to show it ten times in Paris, and we did. I couldn't imagine the French would um, sit for a play that was seven hours long. It seemed more cerebral in my mind that I couldn't imagine that uh, a play in silence. But we ended up playing five and a half months to about 2,000 people every night uh, and sold out. That's what established uh, my career. Then people asked me to go to Berlin to the opera, the Schaubühne in Berlin, and the Piccolo Teatro in Milano, and so on. Yeah, I mean, not so coincidentally, um, this major profile of you in The New Yorker in 1975 by Calvin Tompkins was called Time to Think. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're right, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. <laughs> Time to Think. I think it's something that is more than ever lacking this ability to offer people that that gift. I think so, and especially in uh, cities like New York or Paris, uh, uh, this city life is very hectic, and I think people are drawn to spaces where they can, can have time to think. You know? This sort of gets me to the subject of concentration, and... Marina Abramovich has written, the most impressive thing about Bob Wilson is his concentration when he works. When he enters a rehearsal space, his presence is 100% present. What do you attribute to your level of concentration? Do you think this is something 
that's inherent in you or, or have you sort of trained it up? Well, I think it, in part, first of all, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, my mother uh, was a silent person. She didn't speak very much. And uh, she s sat in chairs beautifully. She was uh, from a poor family and grew up in an orphanage. But she had a space around her that, uh, I don't know, people... Uh, were quieter, and uh, it's just, I think, is something she was born with, but uh, maybe it, it's inherited. I think it is, yeah, and more now as I'm, I'm 81, I, I begin to think uh, about her, and uh, I think it's, it had a profound influence on my thinking and way of being and the way of, you know, I'm mostly known for my work in the theater. But um, my mother also was very good in observation. She said when I was about nine years old, she was talking to a friend of hers and said, Bob uh, thinks by drawing. <laughs> and uh, it's true. If someone had asked me, uh, how did I do the Ring of Wagner? How did I do King Lear? How did I do Einstein on the Beach, the opera I made with Philip Glass? I will take out a, a pen and a piece of paper and make a drawing. And it's usually a very simple diagram that is in, in time and space. And, so I can quickly see the whole by looking at this map of. Yeah, this diagramming idea is really interesting to me. And this being a podcast that connects to time, I, I wanted to bring that up because, you know, you've said that time is something very personal, a line that goes to the center of the earth and goes to the heavens. And basically that space is this horizontal line and times this vertical one. Could you elaborate on that and also maybe share a bit about how that thinking came into your mind? I don't know how it came to mind, but I quite early on became very interested in this cross of this vertical line and this horizontal line, and how that equation, those lines create space. I directed uh, Wagner's Parsifal, at, well, let's say, um, yeah, Parsifal. And the center bar of music in Wagner's Parsifal is at the end of the second act, and Klingsor throws a lance to Parsifal, and he grabs it. And in my production, he grabbed it and turned it vertically, and then slowly turned it horizontally. And he says, time becomes space. And... Right now, we're at the Watermelt Center, a center for creative thinking on Long Island. And this building was built uh, by Western Union uh, scientists, uh, not architects. And they built a vertical building first in red brick. And later, they added a north and south wing. And I saw the building in the late 80s and was attracted to it. It had been on the market for 30 years. Was Western Union had left in the 50s. And I like the organization of the building, that the first building built in the mid-20s was a vertical. And the north and south wings were added, and they were horizontal. I thought, wow, there it is. <laughs> and... Uh, so I essentially cleaned up this building that had been built in, 
in the 20s. They had the entrance to main entrance in the central building. They had to the side, and I opened it up and put it in the center of the building. So if you enter from the street about uh, 500 feet away or two football fields away is the building. And you can walk up a narrow passage and you can look all the way through the building to the west. So the entrance, the formal entrance is in the east. And uh, then if you enter from the, the parking area, which is in the north of the property, you can look all the way through the building to the south. And if you go to the roof of the central building, it's floating. So you, you cannot look down. You can only look up at the sky. So it was constantly reinforcing this horizontal and this vertical. I don't know, I see it uh, in a painting of uh, Barney Newman. He puts that black stripe down the center of the canvas, or we see the drip of milk in the Vermeer painting, uh, this horizontal that is surrounded by horizontal. It's how you stand on a stage. You know, if you feel the, in Japanese theater, they say that the gods are beneath the floor. So the contact of that foot on the floor is essential. And I worked with several uh, opera singers who uh, told me, uh, Jesse Norman told me, said that for her to hit the high note she felt it coming from below her and going up through the top of her head. With Jessie, uh, she, uh, you can see in her face this openness. Look at Martha Graham, the American choreographer and dancer. You can't find a photograph of her where the face is closed, but it's always open. The way a baby, look at a baby's face, you know, it's so open in the way they hear and the way they see. But again, it's something, I don't know, it just took some years to, for this to come to mind. And it's one of the basic things I talk about if I'm directing a play for an actor or a singer. Your plays and operas in many ways are sort of contracting or expanding on on clock time. You don't feel like you're in clock time when looking at one of your performances. And there's this sort of, you know, we could talk about the slowly descending chair in Deaf Man Glance or the clocks on Einstein on the beach. How do you think about the plasticity of time in your work? Well, time for me has no concept. So they say, people say, oh, in Robert Wilson's productions, uh, they all move slow. If I take two minutes to take my hand from my waist to my head, it's one thing. If I think that I'm moving, moving slower than I normally do, it's one thing. But if I don't think about it, and I do it, <laughs> everything is going on. The body is full of a hundred energies, thousands of interests, energies. And one second of different these energies that are going on. And it has nothing to do with something, you know, a, a concept. It's something you experience. And uh, it's not in the, the head, it's in the body. Yvonne Rayner said, the mind is a, a muscle. It's in the muscle do we understand what it is we're doing and the experience. It's not a, a, an intellectual thing. 
And Susan Sontag said to experience something is a way of thinking. So if I watch a sunset or it's something I experience. I mean, it doesn't have to tell me something, but it's something I experience. And uh, that's to me the most important that in theater, my, I've often said that my theater is non-interpretive, but it's, uh, I think it's something that you experience. And um, I met Gregory um, <laughs> what was his name? Luganus, I think. The Olympic diver. Mm, yeah, Luganus, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I had been in Paris, and I watched him uh, on TV diving. And uh, there was something so special about when he dived, and you saw him in the air, I couldn't explain this, so I asked him what he was thinking about when he was doing it. And he said, well, for him to prepare, he knows everything technically he has to do. So he knows that if he has uh, 32 steps to walk up the diving board, he will start with his left foot, left foot, right foot. And when he's on the top of the board then, and walking out, he knows how many steps and uh, which foot is going to be first, second, and the th he must said I must always be balanced. And uh, so he said I program my computer, my mind, before I do it, and uh, then I know I have to do it. So if I think about it, I can't do it. But now I have to do it. And he said that his sensation when he was jumping off of the board, going into the water, is that he had the sensation he was going up and not down. So <clears throat> every opposite needs its opposite. And uh, But I said, wow, that sounds like a formula for a great actor that... Uh, I work a lot in Germany in the theater, and the German theater is uh, very cerebral for the most part. You know, a German actor, their heads are always so heavy because they're thinking all the time. But my work is uh, more, is closer to animal behavior. So if you see a dog walking to a bird, you know, the way his foot touches the ground, the way his back is listening, the way his tail is listening, the way the foot is listening as he walks. He's not listening with the eardrum only. It's the body. If there was a grizzly bear here, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's looking at you, uh, He's waiting for you to move. Kleist, the German author, said, a good actor is like a bear. He will never move first. I wrote a love letter to my cat a couple of years ago, and I was directing uh, a play, a, a Dorian, based on Dorian Gray and, and Dusseldorf. And I had before going to Dusseldorf for rehearsal, I had watched my cat every morning. Uh, and she'd walk in and walk through the kitchen, walk down steps into a dining room. And she would go over to one spot and lie down. And then she would get up and she'd walk around the table, go back up the steps the same in the center, and sometimes sit at the top of the steps. Sometimes she would just get up and run wildly. She was so playful, but she was following pretty much the same choreography every day. And it was, she was so joyful and playful. Uh, 
and going through this ritual. And uh, well, part of what you're talking about is sort of this idea of timing, and you know, it makes me think of the movements of Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton. It's not totally disconnected the muscle memory they must have. No, well, I mean, if you take Chaplin. Uh, the film, sometimes it's 275 or 300 takes of one scene. So if I take my hand up in the air and move it quickly and freeze it and take it down slow and then freeze it and then put it back on my leg, first time I do it is very free. But for me to learn to do that again, it takes a lot of practice until I can be free again. Martha Graham said in the first line of her autobiography, I am a dancer and I learn by practice. <laughs> hey everyone, taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our season eight presenting sponsor, the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels which this year is working with the American Museum of Natural History in New York to present the exhibition Garden of Green, exquisite jewelry by Van Cleef and Arpels at the museum's Mignone Hall of Gems and Minerals. On view through January 2024, Garden of Green showcases 44 creations from the French High Jewelry House, 32 of which are on view in the U.S. for the first time. Creating a lush garden of jewelry, this impressive array of precious and ornamental green stones forms a dazzling journey that celebrates the beauty of gardens and nature. To learn more, visit www.amnh.org slash exhibitions. That's www.amnh.org slash exhibitions. And now, back to the episode. On the subject of time, I wanted to bring up Time Rocker. Okay. From 1996, your piece of musical theater with Lou Reed. It took for its subject matter The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And I was wondering how you think about time in the context of that particular piece. I mean, it's pretty on the nose since it's called Time Rocker, but I, I, I did want to hear that. Well... I did it on the anniversary of H.G. Wells and I had heard and met Lou Reed briefly in, in the 60s, mid-60s and then late 60s, saw him on different occasions. Uh, didn't really know him, but I somehow felt that Lou would be the right person to ask to create a, a musical stage work. And um, what I learned from Lou was how to appreciate the loudness and sound. And Lou had this enormous range in which he could be so quiet and tender with a song or with his music. And at the same time, on the other hand, could be the loudest. And I really began to appreciate the loudness and sound. Uh, and we had a great collaboration because of that very simple thing. That, uh, and one thing sets up another. And so that, uh, again, if I hear <laughs> that space afterwards, it, it's so powerful. So... If we're talking time, I also think we should talk about duration. And, you know, you were mentioning the length of, of one of your plays earlier, and some of these performances are staggering from 12 hours to 24 hours to seven days. Right. I did want to talk about the seven-day performance, which was Ka Mountain and Gardenia Terrace from 1972 in Shiraz, Iran. You worked with 500 local extras there. I mean, how on earth did you pull that one off? Well, I couldn't write a play that was seven days long. Uh, I couldn't uh, rehearse the whole thing. I had a few months, but 
We had 580 performers. So what I did was to make a map. And I had uh, this grid of 24 hours divided by seven. So I had seven horizontal lines divided by 24. So let's say, okay, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., we're going to have these 30 people make an event, a play this outdoors on this location in Iran, and the theme should be a flood. So whatever you want to do, you can write and direct, and if something that is just a, an hour long. And then this group over here, let's take another group of 30, 40 people, you do something from 9 to 10. And that also is based on day one as a flood. Until I have the 24 hours divided by these 500 people. And they all had a, a, a time slot to create something based on a common theme. And then the next day, there was another theme. But we would go, the group that was working from eight to nine will come back and they'll make another event at that time. So it's a little bit like a, a, a TV program or something. That, so I made a mega structure. And then I had everyone fill it in. It's a little bit like the, an architect designs the city. And Paris is a beautiful city. It's got a, a beautiful plan to it. So if someone said, okay, you know, this is going to be an obelisk, or this is going to be an arc of triumph, this is going to be... And you have these avenues. and But you have this mega structure. So... Even today, uh, Frank Gehry or whomever as an architect can build something, but you build it within the megastructure. Uh, if you live in a, an apartment building, so an architect has designed the building, and you can live in the building, you have your own apartment, and you can decorate it or design it to your liking. And I can live in it and live in my apartment and do it as I like it. And we all can have our own self-expression, but there's a cohesion because of the megastructure. So that's how I wrote the seven-day play. I would have worked with the megastructure and then divided it into uh, different people and for their aesthetics. And the community lead, they decided what they wanted. And then, so in some ways, my job was easy. <laughs> <laughs> and it went on for seven days and nights. I never saw the whole thing. I, uh, when we opened, uh, I was there at, at uh, midnight, and I stayed up almost three days, and then I collapsed and woke up. I was in a hospital, and I couldn't figure out where I was. It took me some time to say, oh, I'm here in Shiraz and I'm doing this. And anyway, I had become dehydrated and I passed out. But I got back on the third day and managed to see some each day to the end, but I never saw the whole thing. There is a level of endurance, I suppose, <laughs> to some of these performances. Well, Lincoln Kirsten said in the late 50s, modern dance will have no tradition. And I was very puzzled when I read that. But in a sense, he's right. And the work we were doing in the 60s and 70s, uh, we called them happenings. I did a play, uh, the first play of the Festival of Autumn in Paris, uh, a 24-hour play. And it was announced that it was 24 hours long, and it would be one performance only. So there was something about being there, whether you were stayed up 24 hours or you even saw a few hours. It was never going to happen again. Never. It was what made it special. 
And uh, it's like a shooting star. It happens once. It doesn't happen again. So your experience is different than if something, you know, is going to be every night the same thing, more or less. I have to bring up light here because I feel like when talking about and thinking about your work, light is another one of these elements that's just so crucial. And I was reading a little bit about the hours you've devoted to processing, thinking about really curating your eye to the lighting. I read it took 80 hours to light the golden windows and 100 for Madame Butterfly. (laughs) How do you think about this time you've spent engaged with light and in determining how your plays and operas are lit? Without light, there's no space. Einstein said, light is the measure of all things. In my first year at the in studying architecture, I was very fortunate that Louis Kahn came and spoke. And the first line of his talk was, students, start with light. Wow. It had a profound influence on me. Now, in theater, usually what happens is that a playwright writes a play and then someone decides to direct it, and someone decides to design it. And then they put it together and they rehearse it. And then two weeks before they open, they light it. So when I made, uh, let's say, Einstein on the Beach, uh, the first thing I did was to start with light. I drew the light and made drawings of light. And there are only two lines in the world. There's a straight line and a curved line. That's all. So you have to make up your mind. What what do you want? Do you want a hundred straight lines or you know and one straight line? And I structured the four acts. It was four acts and three themes. Uh, I structured it with lines of light. Before I knew anything before I knew what was going to happen on stage. And often people are confused or laugh at me that I will go to rehearsal and start with light in the rehearsal before I know where I'm going. So light creates space. And I'm wearing a black pair of pants and a black t-shirt. And if I look at my black t-shirt and my black pants, it's one thing. But if I take this white paper and put it against my black t-shirt and my black pants, the white is whiter and the black is blacker. And so if you, how do you perform Medea, a woman who's going to murder two children each evening in the theater. You have to find light. There has to be light in the darkness. And so it's, I've done a number of productions of Medea. I did Euripides Medea, I did uh, uh, my own Medea, I did Mark Anthony Charpentier's Medea. Uh, but that was what I was always thinking about was if she has to murder these children and you have a child in the audience, what do you do? How do you do it? So it, it, there has to be light. And maybe Medea is an angel of death or something. I don't know. You, you, it doesn't, but you, every opposite needs its opposite. I said earlier, Shakespeare's great tragedy is the King Lear, when the king dies at the end, if you can laugh a little bit, it'll be much more tragic. You need light, always. 
you've done several plays explicitly about light. I mean, Edison, I would say, is probably <laughs> the, the, the most obvious, which was in commemoration of, of the centenary of the invention of the light bulb. But also Dr. Faustus lights the lights, relative light and the golden windows. Tell me a bit more about this obsession. It seems like light's almost spiritual or religious or halo-like. Well, <clears throat> I'm down looking at a corner of this room and uh, there's light coming in through uh, the windows and uh, if you see it uh, in an hour, the light is now at a 45 degree uh, angle on the floor to, to the wall. And an hour or two hours, it's going to be on the opposite diagonal. Uh, it's a time machine. Uh, The universe is a machine, <laughs> and uh, that's a machine of light. I just did a work on, uh, in Hamburg, uh, age 100 seconds to midnight. It was very much thinking of that, so Stephen Hawking, and it was, uh, uh, he, he, Hawking said the universe is a machine. Don't look at your feet. Look at the sky. <laughs> so <clears throat> the sky is a, is a universe uh, of uh, time and space and light. And uh, the difficulty in... I was... Yesterday, someone was going over plans for a museum... Uh, they're building in uh, Saudi Arabia. It's the young architect, I said, really the challenge is how do we balance between natural light and artificial light? And can you control that to some degree? But it's always... A, if you can, with architecture, necessary to have a mix, and that's how the trick of how you, how you do it. If you look at the Menil in Houston, uh, Rinso Piano's building is so beautifully done. They had a ceiling, have a ceiling of fins, where the natural light can come in from above and hits a semi-curved fin, bounces up and hits another plane, and then filters down through this fin. It's a balance between natural and artificial light, and you can close that somewhat from the light from outside of nature, or you can open it up. Uh, it's very difficult to do, to, in museums especially. That How do you have both natural and artificial light? Look at... And Chiaponti, what he did with the museum in Denver, is so beautiful at night because he thought about how it would look in light at night and how does it look during daylight. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned that building. That's, I, I grew up in Denver. And, uh, oh, you did? <laughs> that was probably the first piece of architecture I ever saw as a kid where I was like, that's not like the other buildings. <laughs> yeah, no, he was a, a genius, so... His only building in the U.S., actually. It is? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to a, a young Robert growing up in Waco, Texas, in the 40s and 50s. Your father was a lawyer, and neither of your parents were interested in art. Yet you found yourself, starting around 10 or 12, putting on plays in the family's garage. I was wondering if you could share 
a little bit about how these plays came to be or or some of these performances, what your memories are of them, if any? Well, I don't really remember too much about what I did. Uh, in those plays, I, I did one uh, work. It was called Ar- Arville Potts and his 356 Dogs. And it's about this character that uh, had many dogs. And uh, the stage sets were fire hydrants for the dogs. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I read uh, that there was one in which you had wrapped a bunch of boys in saran wrap. Yes, that, that was... Later, when I was a teenager, and I had, uh, I think, 12, 10 or 12 nude boys uh, with transistor radios strapped to their chest, and their bodies were bound by um, saran wrap and tightly wrapped, and they could barely walk. To, uh, and then we had these transistor radios on, and they were on different stations, so that you would have a station, if you think of a clock, a station at, at uh, 11 and 5, or a station at uh, 6 and 12, or a station at 3 and 9. Those channels would line up of sound. <laughs> Hey everyone, taking another quick break here to quickly mention the Slowdown's new membership program. At just $100 a year, it provides access to our slate of new member-only newsletters, in-depth stories, immersive interviews, curated recommendations, and exclusive event invitations. If you haven't already checked it out and want to learn more, or if you'd simply like to support this podcast and all that we do at the Slowdown, go to slowdown.tv slash subscribe. That's slowdown.tv slash subscribe. And now, back to the episode. I want to mention your grandmother here, too, and your time with her. I found it fascinating to learn that years later, after you'd long left Waco, and she came to New York to see The Life and Times of Joseph Stalin, your play, you cast her. Uh, (laughs) She Well, after the Stalin, I did a a work called A Letter for Queen Victoria. And my grandmother uh, was living in Texas and uh, was showing the work in Paris. So my grandmother was in Waco, Texas, right in the center of Texas. And I called her and said, asked if she would like to be in my play, A Letter for Queen Victoria. She said, uh, oh, yes, uh, that would be nice. And I said, and you could play Queen Victoria. (laughs) So she came to Paris, and she arrived at the airport, and I met her, and we were driving into Paris. And I said, how are you? And she said, well, I'm pretty good. But, you know, Bob... I've got to take nine pills a day to stay alive. I said, you do? He said, yeah, she said, without them, I wouldn't survive. And she said, Bob? I said, yes. She said, am I going to have to say anything in your play? I said, well, you know, Grandmother, I think you can say what you just said. <laughs> so every night she'd walk on stage stressed like Queen Victoria with a crown on her head, said, you know, I have to take nine pills a day to stay alive. (laughs) And without all those pills, I would just collapse. (laughs) She was a big hit in Paris. (laughs) What an amazing way to spend time together. (laughs) Yeah, she was 90 years old. Quite amazing. (laughs) So obviously there's a lot of terrain we could cover and we only have so much time, but I did 
want to touch on the Watermill Center and what you're building here, this incredible space. And I guess you could almost consider it a, a, a sort of magnum opus. I mean, it is really this total work of art. And I was hoping you might talk a little bit about the space, but also the collection you've built here and how you think about the across time nature of it all, the 5,000 years of objects from everything from an Agnes Martin drawing to Marlena Dietrich's shoes to a Noguchi rocker from Martha Graham's Appalachian Spring. Well, I studied architecture at Pratt Institute and Sybil Maholi Naj at that time was teaching the history of architecture. And uh, it was a five-year course. And she said in the middle of the third year, uh, students, you have three minutes to design a city. Ready, go. So most of us couldn't even find a pencil. But she was serious, and after three minutes, she said, turn in your papers. And I drew an apple. Inside the apple, I put a crystal cube in the core, in the center. And she said, what are you thinking about? I said, I'm thinking about a plan for a city, that our cities need centers, something like a crystal cube that's at the core that can reflect the world, the universe. So Watermill Center is a little bit like that. It's in 1967, I established the foundation and it's based on four principles. And it's been what's guided me through the years with the foundation. So the four principles are, one, look to the past as you go forward. So what did man do in the past? And one of the few things or only thing that remains are artifacts. We want to go back to the Chinese, the Egyptians, to the Mayans, the Greeks. We look at artifacts, what artists had done. And so it's important that we live with some awareness of the history of man. And we know the history of man through artifacts, through art. And at the same time, we are a center for creative thinking, for new ideas for producing work, new work by artists. So you have looking at the past as we go forward. And the other principle is that we must understand our community. Now, I'm at the Watermill Center on Long Island. We have the Shinnecock Nation next door. The Shinnecock Nation were on this land before we were here. But even further back, so we must always be aware of our the community around us, and that must be balanced with a look at the global community. What's happening in Afghanistan? What's happening in Bahia and the jungle? What is happening with the Eskimos? And so here at Watermill, we operate on those four principles. We have about 6,000 works in the collection, and they go back as far back as 5,000 B.C., the summer program here, we have 23 nations represented. But I have uh, people from the community, but we bring people from, whether it's from Africa, whether it's from China, from uh, Latin America. So we have some awareness of what's happening in other cultures. So there's no door. The central building has an opening. So it's like that crystal cube inside of an apple. If we look at a, a, a cathedral in medieval times, uh, rich or poor you could walk in. It was a place where artists played music, wrote music, presented music. Uh, painters showed painting. Uh, it was the highest point in the village. It was the center. It was that crystal cube inside of an apple. So simply... Abstractly, that's how I see uh, the watermill center. So 
you're 81. You've done nearly 200 stage productions to your name. What What are you dreaming of next? <laughs> right now, I'm just trying to get my socks on. <laughs> <laughs> I like when Gertrude Stein, they said, Miss Stein, uh, what will you do next? She said, I think I'll have a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's end there. Thank you, Bob. This okay, is a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. Extra thanks to our season eight presenting sponsor, the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. Van Cleef and Arpels' jewelry is characterized by a distinctive blend of poetry and refinement. With its iconic jewelry collections, it is an invitation to a timeless universe of beauty and harmony. You can discover more at vancleefarpels.com. That's V-A-N-C-L-E-E-F-A-R-P-E-L-S dot com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.tv. To join the Slowdown's new membership program, which provides access to subscriber-only newsletters, in-depth stories, immersive interviews, curated recommendations, and exclusive event invitations, go to slowdown.tv slash subscribe. That's slowdown.tv slash subscribe. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, Hazen Mayo, and Johnny Simon.